Okay, so here's where we ended in the lecture today, so let's just keep going. Um, we were at uh, the 3D methods and some of the results from the test on bed. Um, so if we look at um, this is what we've talked about so far, um, in terms of um, how the what those are, bandits are defined, um, you're seeking your goal, but you don't have a state that you're tracking. You just have your actions and the reward that you're um, gathering. Um, talked about using greedy and epsilon greedy action selection, the simplest way to trade off this exploration exploitation um, choice and, and trade off as you're trying to make a decision. And we saw how a value, even in this very simple domain, um, learning your value of action gives you a way to find a policy to, to maximize some kind of output. You may have some uh, experiments um, from the textbook showing a very simple domain with 10 different uh, distributions. So what we're going to do is kind of generalize this now and say, what is it that we're doing? And that's going to set the groundwork for the things we'll be doing next um, throughout the course. Um, the idea is that averaging over um, a series of rewards can be used to build um, a learning rule, a rule for combining prior knowledge from your experience, your life, um, and using that to act in the future, right? So it really fits to the way people kind of learn, but how do we write that down mathematically and programmatically? Um, so here we're just going to focus on taking one action at a time, um, as we've been doing. And uh, so the formulation, if you think about what we've been building up in the algorithm so far, um, here we update Q, and we, we Q is our estimate of how much value we expect to get from taking this action. Um, and we're going to get a reward each time we pull the bandit or we do something in the world. And so we want to basically make an update of this that's um, compact, right? A simple way to think of it, kind of an exhaustive way to write it out would be to write it this way, right? Um, that there's the rewards you receive at time step one, time step two, time step three, all the way up to the last time step and minus one if you're in step n right now. And the value of n would be the sum of all those rewards averaged by how many steps you had, right? How much did you get? in average um, at every step of the way. So that's one way to represent this value. But what we want to be able to do is not have to keep this sum and kind of update it all the time. Um, we want to have something that's more incremental that we can basically take the last action and update it, right? So you can imagine how you can kind of take these out and make a, a more compact form. So what we're going to do is derive that and it's going to be useful because we're going to start getting this recursive um, representation uh, for for the value function. And yes, I said recursive. So I don't know why some people find recursion scary, but there's a lot of recursive uh, formulas here uh, in this course. So it's uh, very elegant. Um, and basically, you're defining your function and your value in terms of previous values that you you have stored. So it's a way that memory is kind of built in to your function. Um, so the way that we do that, um, is, uh, what we're going to show next. So this is our kind of standard rule. And if you look at, we'll look at, this is the answer because we're going to drive to, and we're going to turn this form into that form. So that's what the next slide we'll do. So I'll, I'll talk about it briefly and then you can kind of stare at it and make sure it works. Um, but. Getting used to this general form is important. And if you look at just down here, um, the uh, kind of general formulation of it, this is kind of one of the more important relationships or formulas in the in the course. It's not really a formula at this point. It's just a relationship between estimates over time and experience. We're going to have many forms of this um, over the course more detail. Here is just kind of a very conceptual level. You have, you want your new estimate, right? What is the value of taking a certain action right now 
at this moment of time, this this final time step that we're at, and right, and the way we're defining that is take your old estimate, so everything you know about how good that is, um, and then take ignore the step size for a moment here, take um, your old estimate, which is um, the same as you have here, so what you previously knew. Um, and the new thing you just learned. So we're calling that target here, but in our formula, it's the reward. So target is a thing that you just kind of um, acquired or learned or what you're currently choosing. So you're deciding whether you should do this or not. Um, so you just found out that this is the reward you're getting or so you've learned something. So what's the difference between that? Because basically this is the thing you're estimating. How good is it to take a certain action? And target is how good it actually was, right? So the difference here tells you something about if you were right or wrong, right? And if this is positive, that means that the reality, the target, the reward you got was better than your estimate because it's positive, right? And if your estimate was higher, then this is gonna be negative, right? So if this term's negative, that means you overestimated it. It wasn't as good as you thought, right? So it's gonna be negative. Um, so if you think of them, what we're doing here, it's really a very simple optimization problem, right? We say, take the old estimate, so assume that you're right, and that's, you know, if this turned out to be zero when it was exactly as we expected, target minus old estimate, the reward we got was exactly what we expected in our Q estimate, this would be zero, that'd be zero, we just copy old estimate to new estimate, and QN plus one would equal Q, right? That kind of makes sense, that if it was exactly as expected, your model shouldn't change. But if it was different, then what do you want to do? You want to change your model to fit the reality, right? And that's exactly what this does, right? Because if you overestimated, you'll get a negative number here, and then you update your estimate by some small amount to push it down so that you don't overestimate so much. And if you were underestimating, if the target was better than you thought, or the reward was higher than you expected, then, um, you want to push it up a bit. And step size here is just a way to say, well, how much should we push it up by, right? A small amount, but what is the right way? So that's the big picture. How do we get there? Because this is defined kind of mathematically. It's just an average, boring um, average of rewards, right? So if you turn that, compose that um, average rewards here um, into a, a sum, you're just getting this. Right, so we're saying we're we're given n. Let's let's compute what it would be at the next step. So assume we have n. Let's let's do induction induction kind of derivation. Can we um, get the next uh, the next step of it? And our goal is to turn turn this formulation um, into the one we have on the previous screen, um, which is this compact recursive form. Um, Right, so how did we get here? So we've got a sum over all the rewards. Um, that one's on n, so we can pull out the last reward and just have it its on its own, right? And have this be up to n minus one, that's fine. Um, here, you could just have n minus one over n minus one, that's just one, right? So you're having this on its, out, on its own. And then here, we're saying that q, uh, we're turning n minus one over n minus one. Sorry, i r i the sum of r i from from one to n minus one divided by n minus one, right, um, is going to give us q n. Right, so we've rederived q n again inside its own equation. Um, that's the for there, it's the previous step because we're starting here on n plus one. So we've derived q n. Right, this is the same form as that. Um, this whole thing. So we can make that into QN. Um, and then we pull out, this was the thing where I had to add an extra note last time. Uh, here, I'll just write what I had. So on this line, so that one's fine, right? So on this line, um, we can pull out just N minus Q, and then we could say um, R of N over n, right, because it gets pulled out on its own, and that gives us n of qn, right, we just, because now they're all over n, um, 
and Qn over n, right? And so the ends actually cross each other out. Um, and we end up with, um, what do we end up with? n over n plus um, Qn on its own, and then minus Qn um, 1 over n Qn. Um, right, well, I guess keep it in the same form. So there's no point doing that. Gives you the same, same form as the, the Qn on that side, right? So now these two together give us um, that term with 1 over n, and we have that. So we're just reconfiguring, actually. I don't know why that seemed hard last year. Um, right, so in this last form, then we've got the one we wanted. And so why do we like that? Um, and this is actually the next slide then. Okay, so that um, gives us this kind of general learning rule. But now what if the situation is a bit more complex? What if we have a non-stationary um, problem? So by non-stationary, we mean that the values, um, the true answer is kind of changing slowly over time. So if you think of the bandit problem, it'd be like a casino where the casino owner was slightly changing the, um, the probability functions of the machines over time. Maybe they want to shift people towards the dinner, dinner um, restaurants um, towards the evening. So they make sure the machines near the restaurant start winning more in the afternoon or something like that. I'm sure no reputable uh, casino ever does that, but uh, you can imagine. So, but in the real world, most things are non-stationary, right? You can learn a probability distribution of some system and reward, and it might be useful right now, but maybe later on, it's not gonna work, right? Um, you can learn the distribution of the traffic lights, but it might work at different times of the day. You can learn to avoid someone in the hallway by not uh, bumping into them as a robot, but maybe that person's not there next time, or even maybe that garbage can isn't there next time, right? The world is non-stationary, so we need to be able to adapt to that. So if you think about um, the sample average case that we're doing right before this, where we're just saying average together everything you've seen, that's the value you can take next, right? That equally weights everything you've ever experienced and says, you know, how often did you win? Was it good or not? That's it, right? It's a very simple model um, and it works in that sense. And it fits this kind of approach of updating your belief. Um, but it uh, wouldn't react because the past is always gonna be just as important. So maybe sometimes you gotta forget the past, right? Um, so um, a much better way to do it would be to say, well, let's let's forget the past. Let's turn this rule and say, instead of having one over N, we're gonna have alpha and it's just gonna be some constant number, but the number is always gonna be uh, less than one, right? Um, so before we had alpha one, um, one over N, but in this case, we're gonna kind of reconfigure um, the weighting and uh, solve for, uh, for things a bit differently, and uh, we'll get a different formulation. Okay. So here, and then if you go to um, section, I won't go through it here, but uh, equation um, 2.6 um, in the textbook um, in Sutton Barto, um, then um, they, they kind of derive this a little bit. Basically, you, you pull this in, you combine those, you solve for it, um, and pull them out. And what's happening here, right? Um, the 2.6 in the book. If you see it um, in the very first step, um, when n is 1, we're going to count, you know, Q1 is the first reward you get as you, the first time you play the game or do the action. Um, and then when n is higher, this is going to be lower and lower, right? Because that n is going to be, you know, we're going to have a fraction to the power 10 to the power 100, right? And so this is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, and it'll always be like that, that the further elements in the past will be smaller. And essentially, it will be an exponential recently weighted average, right? That you're averaging all the rewards together, but the latest ones are going to be the most important, right? And so the constant, the step size alpha you pick is going to depend on how much you want to forget the past, right?
Um, so we're always going to have some bias based on Q, but it will get smaller and smaller over time. And we'll see this as a pattern that recurs again and again, um, different ways to discount the future or the past um, to make sure that you're focusing on the right portion of time. This is focusing on past memories. Um, so one thing you might still ask, though, so then now we've got all these alphas in here and less than ones, and we're going like this. Does this converge at all? So if you think to your optimization classes and stuff, um, you might worry about convergence because the, the goal would be to have those nice curves on the graphs we have, right? So that the curve kind of goes up and then it converges and it stops moving around, right? It doesn't matter maybe how we get there, but we want to stop so it doesn't just keep moving forever. So that's a valid question. Um, there are some results in number theory um, that tell us for things to definitely converge with probability one. Um, that um, what you need is uh, to definitely use serif fonts all the time. So people can tell the difference between a one and an L. Um, for things to converge, you need two things to be true. Um, you need to um, have these two conditions satisfied, right? That essentially, if you summed up all your weights together, and, and n here is time, right? So if you kind of added them up, eventually that it's going to be big enough, right? So there's enough range in here to cover any value you need to get to. So it's not limited by the fact that it's small. And if a n, um, if we're using one over n or some kind of fraction of that, it'll this will happen. We'll get to infinity. But if we have something where n is um, exponentially decreasing based on n, then it, may, it won't converge to infinity, right? That will converge to a finite number. Um, so that would be, this won't, then it won't converge, right? So we're talking about this entire system converging. And essentially, if you boil it down just to sum over the alphas, it needs to be true that this would go to infinity with that. But if you square this thing, um, then it would be finite, you know, that's an infinity, right? Um, and so in this case, uh, you can do fractions again. Um, those won't, right? Because they'll go up to, well, if you square them, they would, right? So one over n works. Um, optimally is kind of one over square root n is, is a very good convergence because it's going to converge as fast as you can, but still satisfy both these. So um, one over square root n is even better than one over n for convergence speed. So that's just some number theory there um, to help us know that it does converge. Um, so some other parts of this, and here's these curves that we want, right? That it's going to be kind of collapsing and, and stabilizing. Um, this is another trick you can add in. And I mentioned this a bit briefly before, because I like it. Um, and this is to say, look, we still have this bias, right? That our first action is still in there and it, like, it's totally uninformed, right? Because we started assuming that the value of all actions were equally bad and we took some actions based on it and then we keep whatever we picked first randomly is going to influence our convergence and it kind of takes a while for that to get washed out right so um if we use the original one that we had um it kind of it grows pretty quickly at the, at the beginning and it has this slow kind of rise it kind of essentially one thing is you have to kind of forget where you started right so it may have helped at the beginning but maybe that's not going to help later um so this optimistic approach is to say, rather than setting all your values initially to zero and having to work them up and prove that they're worth anything, um, you start them all at high value, right? So you throw all, they all start with five, assuming five is a high value in this domain. Um, and then you're gonna have to prove them wrong, right? And so if an action, what does this mean, right? If you think about going through all the 10 arms that you're choosing, if you, um, have never, uh, if you've never chosen one of them before, so you've taken, you've chosen action, you've chosen arms, um, say we've chosen arms two, five, seven, and nine, and now we're trying to choosing another one, right? And with for these ones, we had a reward. We knew we got, um, we got four for this, we got zero for this one, we got two for this one, and we got three for this one, right? So if we're going to choose a new arm now, which one do we choose, right? Um, this is, sorry, this is T. 
and what we're talking about is um, having chosen them at these time steps, right? Just to make it clear. Um, and so what do we choose now? Right, and ah, there we go. If we were using, if we're like, it does something about talking about explore exploit, right? If we were gonna choose the one that gave us the best value before, we're gonna choose that. Um, if we're gonna choose the ones we might know the most about, let's say maybe we went there twice, even more interesting, right? If I said that we actually chose um, arm number two, two times, right? Um, so, you know, how do you choose which is the right um, arm next? So by this rule of optimism, you say, choose the one you don't know anything about, right? Because all the arms you haven't seen here, arm one, three, six, eight, all those ones, right? They've still got a value of five, right? So they look pretty good. So we're gonna pick arm one, right? Because we think it's five, right? And then we do it and we find out it's zero, right? So the value, the, the um, advantage of this very naive rule is that you assume everything you don't know about is good um, and then you find out very quickly that it's not because you try out all the options. So it kind of leads you towards doing things. Um, you're optimistic. You assume everything's going to be great until you find otherwise. And so you note that at the beginning, these ones are really bad. Um, they kind of go down, they go up, they go down, um, and they try to basically, uh, they're all over the place. And then it still stays low. But later on, it gets much better, right? Because it has now explored all the actions quite thoroughly. It's at least learned something about all of them, right? Um, and this one has actually, is still very low greediness. I'm surprised it's actually zero, um, but that's the